design of uh, flexible and still kind of functional circuits using uh, indium gallium zinc oxide transistors. And here I should maybe mention that if we talk about circuits, what we really mean is relatively simple circuits with low transistor counts operating mostly in the analog domain. So we talk about amplifiers, buffer circuits, mixers for sensor condition. Okay, so let me start by showing you two pictures of uh, some uh, smart textiles we fabricated in the past because this pretty well illustrates the kind of dilemma we face when we fabricate uh, flexible circuits. So on the one hand side, you can see an actually fully working near infrared spectroscopy system, which is integrated into a textile containing amplifiers, diodes, sensors, and so on to measure the blood oxygenation level. Um, but you can also see that the system is not fully flexible, right? So we have partially rigid components, which is obviously something we don't want if we attach textiles to our skin. Uh, we have localization of strain, sharp edges, and so on. At the same time, we can see, okay, if we go for fully flexible approaches, we can actually integrate electronic devices into exactly the same textile in a much more unobtrusive way. So here we have single fibers which carry transistors, but we can see, okay, here the electronic functionality is obviously quite limited, at least if you compare two examples. So the problem when we face is always the same. So on the one hand side, we have to optimize the electrical performance, which means performance of transistors and circuits. But on the other hand, we also have to take care of the mechanical performance of the devices. And of course, these two properties are not independent of each other when we talk about flexible circuits. So what we will do here is we will actually talk about these two, um, let's say, areas we have to optimize the electrical performance such as the speed of transistors the complexity of circuits and so on and also the mechanical performance such as the bendability or parameter shifts induced by bending and then we can see how we can understand you know these two fields individually and also how they interact to be able to fabricate and design um, properly functional flexible circuits okay so the way we do this is by using a model system. So we fabricate our transistors uh, using purely inorganic materials. We also don't do any printing. It's uh, all clean room processing. And we use various, oh, sorry, uh, we use various different types of substrates, which are all polymeric. So this can be polyamide, but it can also be PDMS, uh, perylene, and so on. Um, our semiconductor is always the same. We use indium gallium zinc oxide simply because you know it provides good mechanical performance, electrical performance, and the ability to be you know, deposited at low temperatures, compatible with these you know, temperature sensitive substrates. Then we use insulating materials. It's aluminum oxide. The reason for aluminum oxide is simply it forms a really nice and defect free interface with this uh, indium gallium zinc oxide. And finally, we also use different conductors, most of them metals to fabricate contacts, interconnection lines, and so on. So you can see I'm a little bit weak when we talk about substrates and also conductors, and the reason is, you know, we have to use different substrates and different conductors to optimize the mechanical performance mostly of our transistors for different applications. You will see this later. Nevertheless, the, the fabrication process, the standard of our transistors is always the same. So what we do is we do bottom gate transistors, which means we fabricate everything on a freestanding polymer substrate foil. Um, we encapsulate the foil. That's not necessary, but it helps with the processing a little bit, so it prevents outgassing and things like this. That's done using a silicon nitride. And then we deposit the bottom gate, which is uh, metallic, and uh, we structure all the layers using a UV photography, red etching, and lift-off processes. So the gate is insulated with aluminum oxide, as mentioned, that's 25 nanometers thick, uh, ALT deposited. We do uh, RF sputtering to deposit the semiconductor, which is 15 nanometers thick. We contact the semiconductor using source train contacts, yeah, made from uh, mostly gold plus an adhesion layer. And then we also passivate our structures with an additional 25 nanometers of aluminum oxide. So the whole sub I mean, the whole device stack is something that's about 120 nanometers thick, which is obviously also helpful when it comes to making good. Okay, 
So after fabrication, these devices look like this. You can see we fabricate them, in this case, on a 50 micron thick polymide substrate. Substrate sizes are in the range of 7 by 7 centimeters, and that's enough to fabricate 1,000, even 10,000 watt transistors at the same time, which is, of course, important when it comes to fabrication of circuits. You can see the standard layout, although I also have to say, you know, the layout also varies a lot depending on the performance you want to achieve or the measurements you want to perform. Okay, so now what about the electrical performance of this kind of transistors? Let's have a look at the standard uh, DC performance. First, um, we can see a few different uh, ways of characterizing them. We see transfer characteristics. The transistors offer mobility around 15 uh, centimeters squared per volt second, which is pretty standard for this type of material. Um, we have threshold voltages around one volt. And here in this electric uh, potential microscopy video, you can see that they actually work as pretty good switches, offer on-off ratios in the range of 10 to the power of 8. So that's uh, kind of uh, promising, but I already mentioned that uh, we are really interested in the fabrication of analog circuits. So the DC characteristic is helpful, but what we are really interested in is the AC performance of our transistors. So this means we also have to look at the AC performance, and the way we do this is we use the transit frequency as a figure of merit. Um, the transit frequency is simply the unit gain, current gain frequency of a transistor. It uh, gives you an idea of the speed, although I have to say this speed, so the transit frequency of a single transistor is always larger than the usable speed of a circuit in the end, so there's some sort of effect of 10 in between. Okay, so one reason we go for the transit frequency is because it can be easily calculated. It basically only depends on the transconductance and the oxide capacitance, two parameters we can get from the DC performance of our transistors. Um, and if we use this equation, we can furthermore see that the transit frequency depends on 1 over the channel length squared, which is exactly the reason why Moore's law gives us faster transistors uh, every year. So if we now use this equation and you know, the parameters from the last slide, mobility, threshold voltage, and so on for our transistors, we can plot this kind of ideal behavior. Um, that we have the channel length here, the transit frequency, and if we go for, let's say, reasonable channel length, like one micrometer, that's kind of easy to fabricate, we can see, well, we can expect pretty good frequency performance in the range of hundreds or even you know, thousands of megahertz, which uh, sounds really promising. Now, the problem is obviously, that's a very ideal way of looking at this problem, and we kind of ignore the fact that we are talking about flexible transistors. If we talk about flexible transistors, then we have to consider the effects of the substrate and the mechanical properties of the substrate, in this case, during the fabrication. The biggest problem we have here is expansion of the substrate due to you know, thermal stress, absorption of solvents, absorption of water, and things like this during the fabrication, which means uh, our substrate changes its size quite a bit, something like you know, 20, 30 microns. Which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you fabricate one micrometer short transistors, then that, that's a very significant amount. So what we actually need is we need overlaps to compensate for this expansion. And the most important overlap is obviously the one between the drain source and the gate content. So we need these overlaps to ensure our transistors are functional, or we can fabricate more than one transistor in the center of the substrate. But then this, of course, in return influences the electrical performance again, right? Mostly in two ways. First of all, these overlaps cause capacities. So these parasitic capacities are actually bad. And you can see because of these overlaps, right, the capacitance of these transistors, they never reach zero, if, even if you apply negative bias in the initial channel. So that's obviously something negative when we talk about the transit frequency. At the same time, and this makes the situation a bit complicated, these overlaps also influence the contact resistance. And in this case, a larger overlap is actually beneficial because it reduces the contact resistance, which means now we have two parameters, contact resistance and overlap capacitance. We want to reduce both values, but one is proportional to the overlap, the other one is inversely proportional to the overlap. So we have to figure a way how to design the transistors in, let's say, the most appropriate way. And the way we did this is we actually included these two effects into a slightly modified version of this uh, transit frequency equation. Um, it now considers 
the overlap capacities between the gate and the source drain, and also the contact resistances, which basically influences the effective mobility of the drivers. Um, and we can basically write this new equation in this kind of simplified form, which is made from three um, factors. The first one is basically the original term, the frequency, and it just corresponds to this uh, black line. Um, the second term now is some kind of penalty factor which uh, uh, considers the overlap capacitance and it corresponds to this dotted line here, the red one, and you can see, okay, this already you know, makes the situation worse, it reduces the capacitance. But the biggest influence actually comes from the contact resistance, which you know is considered in this last term, and we can see now the contact resistance really bends down uh, the transit frequency of these transistors. And we can see two important things. First of all, okay, the transit frequency is smaller. That's something already expected, obviously. But what's more important for us and for the fabrication of circuits is, you know, the scaling is absolutely not efficient anymore to go to short in general. So it really flattens out that if you make our transistors shorter, you cannot make them faster anymore, or at least not significantly faster without changing materials and fabrication processes. So, at the same time, of course, we can see, well, okay, we are still above 100 megahertz, which is probably okay for a lot of circuits. So the next question is, of course, can we verify this model? Does this make sense? Is it just some kind of useless calculation? And this, of course, means we also have to measure the transit frequency of our transistors. And this can actually be done using network analysis. So what we can do is we can measure S parameters. We do this by applying a DC bias. And here, to say, we optimize the DC bias points to get high frequencies. And then we uh, use the S parameters here, do some calculations, and convert them into the current gain of the transistor. The frequency we get the current gain, then as I mentioned, right, the unity gain frequency of the current gain is the transit frequency of these devices. And now what we see is, okay, we can reach relatively high values, at least you know, for the world of flexible electronics. And what's more important for us, you know, these measurements actually follow the trend which is determined by the contact resistance. So I would say this at least means we can understand what's going on in this type of transistors and we know how to design them to, let's say, optimize the frequency and uh, the yield at the same time. Okay, so I would say from the electrical point of view, we are kind of ready to fabricate uh, circuits. We know how fast they are, we know how they behave, but we haven't talked about the mechanical properties yet. And that's, of course, something we have to do as well. So let's have a look into the mechanical properties of these transistors. Um, first of all, this means we have to characterize the mechanical properties of our transistors, and uh, we do this in two different ways. First of all, we have a setup which allows us to measure them while we enter the transistors without the need to reestablish contacts, so we can do reliable uh, measurements of, uh, for example, transit characteristics of the transistors, why they are bent, compressive, what tends are ready, if they're ready, and so on. But uh, what we also have to do is, if we see some modification of the, of the electrical performance, we of course also have to understand where they come from, and we do this by using some kind of structural analysis. Most often we use uh, focused ion beams to look at the cross-section of these transistors, and that's exactly what we can see here. So that's, for example, the device stack in the focused ion beam, why the transistor is bent, and then for measurements like this, we can see, okay, which device layer cracks, how do they behave, all of them cracking, and so on, and everything else at the same time. So, let's have a look at the electrical performance first, because here we can generate quite, you know, intuitive plots, and they always look the same. In this case, I only show tensile um, stress, but they could be exactly the same for compressive stress. And as I said, these plots, are always more or less the same, and they tell us that there are actually two different operation regions for these inflexible transistors in the strain. So what we can see is for small strain values, right, we start at a certain mobility in this case, and then we can see that the, this performance parameter shift, in this case the mobility increases for tensile strain. Um, and this increase is not extremely huge, it's the order of a few percent. And what's even more important for us, it's, it's reversible. So if we reflatten the devices, we go back to the starting point. That's good. So it's a fully elastic behavior. At the same time, if we bend our transistors too much, 
and too much in this case means something like 0.7 percent, which corresponds to a 24 millimeter spending radius. So this would be like a big substrates. Uh, we can see this really drastic drop of the performance, and I mean it could get even worse than before. And this drop is not you know, reversible anymore. So if this happens once, then your transistor is permanently damaged, and that's simply because of the formation of cracks. Yeah? So this means we have some kind of plastic deformation as well. So what does this mean in terms of the sign of functional circuits? Well, there are two things, right? So first of all, we have to avoid that our transistors crack, while they should not. And then at the same time, we have to make sure that even if the transistors are not cracking, when we use them in the desired application, we have to make sure that this parameter shift here doesn't influence the performance of the circuit. So we basically have two problems and we have to resolve them semi-independently. Let's have a look at this plastic performance first. So how can we avoid formation of cracks in transistors? And there are basically two options. I think both of them are quite intuitive. The first one is, well, we can make sure the transistors can survive higher levels of strain, which basically means we can use more ductile materials. Now we are a little bit limited because we use indium gallium zinc oxide and aluminum oxide ceramic materials um, to ensure good electrical performance. But what we can do is we can use different materials, metals, for the contacts. And now some people might think, yeah, that's probably not very really useful because, yeah, ceramic materials and metals, the ceramic material will determine dependability. But actually, that's not true, um, as you can see here. So what we did is we just fabricated a few different transistors using different metals as the gate contact. So we used titanium, chromium, platinum, and copper. We choose these materials because they have, first of all, different adhesion on the flexible substrate and, more importantly, different utilities. And we measure the transistors. We can see, well, they don't significantly influence the mechanical properties, uh, sorry, the electrical properties of the transistors, which kind of shows us, for example, threshold voltage is not determined by uh, the work function of the material, a material, but it's really uh, due to the, the interface quality. But if we look at the mechanical, performance, we can see there's a really strong link between the dependability of the whole transistor and the ductility of the gate metal. So if you go from the most brittle material, chromium, to the most ductile material we used, copper here, we can see an improvement by a factor of two yeah, in uh, minimum bending radius, which of course also corresponds to an you know, increase of two of the maximum strain of these devices and so on. So that's one really nice way to tune the dependability of these devices without causing too much trouble during the fabrication, we simply use different materials uh, for the gate contents. Okay, but that's only one option. What about the other option to reduce the strain? Uh, well, the answer is we simply reduce the strain. So we make sure that even if you made our transistors, you know, they don't experience a lot of strain. And there are basically two ways to do that. First of all, we can encapsulate the transistors and move them to the neutral strain axis of the substrate. We tried that and we can go down to a few hundred micrometers bending radii, which sounds promising. But the problem is, as we saw on Monday, this also increased the stiffness of the whole substrate quite a bit in the whole system. So that's not really the option of choice here. So what we did instead is we simply went to super thin substrates. So we fabricated exactly the same kind of transistors on only one micrometer thin polymer substrates, polyimide, in this, uh, sorry, arin in this case. Um, and this means we reduce the substrate thickness by a factor of 50, which means we reduce the strain, reduce the bending by a factor of 50. And this means we can now, you know, do kind of whatever we want with these transistors uh, without destroying them. Now we can even bend them around the ears if it goes too much. Okay, so that's fine. I think we can control the formation of cracks. Um, but we should not forget that we still have this problem of uh, parameter shift for the formation of cracks happens. So, and that's actually a problem we cannot easily solve by changing the structure. The only thing we can do here is we can try to analyze it properly and try to understand it so we can design our circuits accordingly. So what we did a lot was, you know, measurements of different performance parameters, threshold voltage and mobility. We could do similar plots for the sub-threshold swing, for example, for tensile and compressor strain in the elastic region yeah, without the formation of cracks. And what we see is the behavior is very linear, which is actually good because this means we can easily model. I will not explain why this happens. It's just you know, linked to the standard you know, 
mistakes of Spain and Italy, and this change of the effect of mass and banking. Okay, so now if you use all this knowledge about the electric and mechanical performance, how can we design proper circuits? So we do this by the aid of spice simulations, yeah, because we cannot fabricate too many variations of our circuits. And uh, to, to, uh, to achieve this, we use different types of uh, spice, general age spice models. We modified them. You know, for example, this one here, we included all, all the, you know, the knowledge about scaling uh, and electrical parameters we have. And uh, we also use the level 61 model. And we modified it, so added additional equations, right, to consider bending. Then we can see, okay, we can actually simulate the influence of strain and also scaling of the transistors in SPICE. And we can now use this to design circuits. Okay, now before we fabricate actually useful circuits, two tiny more comments, what we have to consider when we do this. And the first um, thing is we have to take care of the alignment of the individual transistors. It's really important that all our transistors align in parallel. Demonstrated this here using this NAND gate with all transistors aligned parallel and some of them aligned perpendicularly. Uh, because as you can see here, if you measure these NAND gates, right, if you align all transistors in parallel to each other, the insensitive strain, the output characteristic here doesn't change if you bend them. But um, if some of these transistors are aligned perpendicular, some of them are influenced in a different way by strain, then you know, the performance of the circuit changes. So that's the first important thing all transistors in parallel. Unfortunately, this doesn't help if you care about the current uh, in the circuit because this only works because you know, the performance depends on the ratio of the performance of different transistors. So we also developed a few you know, circuits which can actively compensate the influence of strain using a feedback. Here the idea is we adjust the gate voltage if the transconductance of the transistor increases or the other way around, you know, to compensate the influence of strain. And you can see this actually works. We can reduce the influence of strain and then if you combine all this knowledge we can start to fabricate useful circuits and that's the last slide I just show you one example um, of circuits which are optimized for the positioning of sensors it's a cherry hopper amplifier which provides quite good electric performance so we can have uh, gain bandwidth products kind of close to 10 megahertz and these circuits obviously operate with okay so that's it but the take-home message is we have to provide knowledge about electrical and mechanical performance to uh, design fully operational flexible